Welcome to Wizards Institute, the number one community to learn smart investing and financial independence. All right, today I'm very excited to have as our guest, Warren, uh, who runs a very popular YouTube channel, commenting, analyzing Tesla, amongst other topics. Uh, Warren, welcome, and thank you for your time. Could you uh, explain to us a bit about your background and how you came to become a YouTube star? Sure. I don't know if star is the right word, but um, and it's not, I can't make this that short, but I grew up in upstate New York um, in a town called Gelderland. I went to college at Rice University where I majored in mathematical economics, and I've always been uh, a math geek. And I think that part, partly the math gets me interested in Tesla and SpaceX and engineering topics, even though I, when I went to college, I thought I might study engineering and it turned out I wasn't good enough or I didn't work hard enough and I didn't make it as an engineer. So I studied economics. I went to graduate school. I was a PhD student at Stanford Business School's uh, program in political economics. I did that for three years, ended up deciding not to pursue the PhD and went to law school and in my hometown where my father was a law professor. Um, graduated from law school in a bad year when there were no jobs. So I went to Japan and taught English for a year in Hiroshima, Japan, and uh, came back, found a job, found another job, um, and then ultimately, I started my own law firm in 2003 and had success. Initially, it was a big struggle, but I built a website and I, it was in the early days of websites. And I really kind of had the first good attorney website in the Albany, New York area. And I built up, uh, I probably had the most successful web-based practice, mostly doing traffic tickets and personal injury cases and criminal defense. Um, out of that in 2005, I built a website called towncourt.com with a hyphen between town and court um, that I would call a web startup that was somewhat successful and made me enough money that I could retire at the age of 45 and move to Florida. So at 45, I retired. I thought I retired, <laughs> moved to Florida, moved to this house um, and uh, tried retiring. And it turns out I'm not very good at it. And I kept finding things to do. So uh, I started up a uh, journalism startup called West Boca News. I'm in Boca Raton, Florida, the western end of it. So I started up West Boca News. We are the leading media for about 100,000 people on the west side of Boca Raton. And that. And then uh, I tried becoming a realtor. I, I tried starting up a law practice here. That kind of didn't go anywhere. I still have some cases, but I'm mostly retired. I still do some cases in New York. Uh, mostly retired from both. I started up as a realtor, been very unsuccessful as a realtor. <laughs> I've had a couple transactions, but not very much. Um, and then about, it's a little more than a year ago, I've had a YouTube channel for a long time. I've made videos from time to time and I've had a couple of successful videos, but nothing spectacular. About a year ago, a little more than a year ago, I made a video about SpaceX, about uh, SpaceX Starship. I think that's the video that started it all. That got me going. <laughs> And that video got a lot of views. It pushed me into monetization and I really enjoyed making the video. I thought, well, I'll make some more videos about SpaceX and then I'll make some videos about Tesla. And I, I have always been making videos about criminal justice issues and libertarian things because I'm a libertarian. That's another part of my background we could talk about if you want. Um, but the, the videos about Tesla and SpaceX really started to take off. So I started making more of them. And at a certain point I realized, wait a minute, this might actually be a business. <laughs> so uh, we're at the point where we are now, which I make roughly three videos a week, two regular videos and one live stream. And sometimes I make more, sometimes less. And it's it's making money and it's growing and I'm, I'm spinning off. Now I have a Patreon account and now I, have, I sell t-shirts related to my videos. Um, and I'm, I'm still exploring and still learning and that's, that's where it's gone and I'll, you know, I started investing in Tesla. I think it was 2016 was the first time I bought shares. Um, I have a fast, I've always been fascinated by technology and uh, you know, Elon co-founded PayPal and I was using PayPal in 2003, if not earlier for my law firm. You know, I had mentioned I had a website that handles traffic and criminal cases and I've probably received over probably more than a million, maybe more than $2 million in revenue through PayPal um, over the course of, you know, from 2003 to the present. So over a long period of time. 
So I knew who Elon was. Elon started up Tesla. I was sort of vaguely aware of it. He started up SpaceX. I was somewhat aware of it. And I followed it a little bit. And I, I, the more I cover, the more I look into what Elon is doing, what his companies are doing, the more I cover it, the more excited I get. I, you know, it's, I make these videos. I mean, I certainly like the idea of making money from it, but I make the videos because I'm genuinely interested in a topic related to it. And I'll make it like the video I'm working on now is what do I think the 2023 Tesla compact will be? And I'm generally interested in it and I'm genuinely pursuing, okay, where do I think this is going? What will this be? One of my most popular videos right now is my projection for 2030 about where I think Tesla is going in terms of batteries, revenue and the stock market. So I'm excited about it. I make videos about it and I have fun doing it. It turns out you can make money at this. I don't make that much money at it yet, but you know, I can see the path. I can see the path to growth. So. Warren, uh, in the uh, Bitcoin crypto space, uh, I, I was investing in a few years back as well. People like to say their first crypto or Bitcoin experience when they first experienced it. You mentioned 2016 for Tesla. Now, what prompted you, what caught your attention about Tesla? The product, the technology, but also obviously investing in it. What, what was that moment? Sure. I think... So I think my investment in Tesla probably goes back to my investment in Amazon. Um, I, I don't remember what triggered it exactly in 2016. I think, I think it was more, I, I, I wasn't a believer yet. But uh, 2013, I realized I was addicted to Amazon Prime. And I, I would check Amazon every day to see what the deals were. And I, I was you know, getting a package a day. Not, I was probably getting three or four packages a week from Amazon. And it dawned on me that I'm kind of an early adopter. And if I'm addicted to Amazon Prime now, there's a pretty good chance other people will get addicted to it later. So I bought some Amazon and it, I'm up about 10X what I paid for it in 2013. And I didn't anticipate I was gonna be up 10X. I just thought this looks like, and I, you know, I manage my own IRA. I manage a family portfolio uh, for family. It's a long story behind that, but I manage a family portfolio I've been managing for more than 20 years. Um, and I used to just do funds and then I started buying a stock here or there and I started buying more stocks and I don't really buy funds anymore. I mostly buy stocks, except I bought ARK. That's a long, that's another story. Um, Kathy Wood's fund. Sure. But um, so the experience with Amazon um, sort of made me see, okay, now I'm looking at Tesla and I, I, I'd love to tell you, I know exactly what happened in 2016. Were you driving a Tesla in 2016? No, I, I still don't own a Tesla. I'm waiting on a cyber truck. I, I, uh, I last bought a car in 2018. The model three was just coming out. I did not have a reservation. Um, I, I have not actually, not, in terms of my general income, I haven't been making a lot of money. I made a lot of money for a, for a window of time. I've had some very good years as an attorney and, and as a web entrepreneur from my towncourt.com website. But over the last few years, I really haven't been making that much money. And I just needed a car because my lease was up on my, I think it was an Acura MDX. And um, okay. the so, dance were cheap. So I bought, so anyway, sorry. So um, I think it was the SpaceX launch. I think it was, it, it was December. So I think I, the first shares I bought from Tesla were February, 2016. And I think the decisive moment for me was probably December 12th. I think it's December, is it December 21st, 2015 was the first time they landed a Falcon 9 booster. Okay, so and so your, your, your fascination is, so my, my journey is slightly different in the sense that I, I drove the, the, the X and I hated driving until I, got, I started driving a Tesla. <laughs> uh, so your journey was really a fascination with the business and the technology and Elon that, drove, that, that got you into the stock, so as I think, opposed to experiencing the product itself. Right, I have, I have driven a Tesla. My neighbor had a Model 3 that let it, me drive. He it. has a Model mm -hmm. Y now that I, I made a video of my, of my neighbor's Model Y. Um, I think I came to Tesla plainly as an investor that I'm looking for, okay, I 10 x this Amazon, right? I don't think I had 10 x Amazon at that point. I had 6 x or 3 or 4 x Amazon at that point. I'm like, okay, let me find another investment. I think my the first time I bought stock was just dipping the toes in the water, you know, bought a few shares. But I started becoming a believer. I started following what was going on with the company. Um, I, 
I'm a buy and hold investor. I, it's one of the things I notice on Twitter in particular, and maybe to some extent on YouTube, is there's all these people who are talking about buying call options or put options, and they're playing all these short-term gains. I'm going to sell now, and I'm going to get back in later. I just buy stock and hold it. I have, I have, I have probably made between the two the two accounts, fifteen to twenty purchases of Tesla stock over a, even recently, so over a two a four year span. I have never sold a share. I I, I buy and hold. I don't sell. Um, I sell other stocks if I think they're done, but I think Tesla's ramp is long. So I just looked at the company and said, you know, I think there's something here. Initially, it was dipping the toes in the water. This is a good diversification. This buy into something different. It might grow. And then they just started performing. They just started delivering on what they were trying to do. And, and I, somewhere in there, I really just bought in. Somewhere I just okay. said, wait a minute, you know, this is it. And... I started following it more and I think like, I want a Tesla. <laughs> I do want a Tesla, but you know, I don't actually drive that much. I actually think a Tesla would be wasted on me because a Tesla should be driven by somebody who drives 25,000 miles a year. Uh, I, I drive about 10,000 miles a year. So, so yeah, you know, it's a, to me it's addictive. So we, we've had the X for three and a half years now. And again, prior to that, I just hated driving. And even before COVID where I think safe, safe enough to drive, I was, driving it just because it's such a fun car to drive and testing the software. I recently acquired a Y as well. And it's almost like comparing iPhone 8 and iPhone 12 <laughs> because you can see the difference. It's kind of subtle if you've driven the old one versus the new one. And I think it's addictive, which is kind of partly why you say is that what, you know, once you understand the product, you got to feel it and experience it. So I, I kind of see that. But, you know, this is a good segue. You've done a lot of videos, some great content in there. Uh, Perhaps you could spend three, five minutes to give us a Warren case for Tesla. Sure. Uh, well, plain and simple, you know, I have driven Teslas. I, I read, read reviews of them. I read the, I think the, go to the Wall Street Journal, uh, Dan Neal, I think is his name, called the Model Y the best car in the world. Um, they're making the best cars. Um, I think that you have to look at, to me, it's a future thing. It's not, they are making the best cars in the world, but it's more about the future. It's where is the transfer, not just the car industry, but where's the transportation industry going over the next 10 years, let's say. So it's easy to think about it in terms of sticker price. And then you say, well, Teslas are expensive. Okay. Yeah. But then if you look at things like total cost of ownership, Tesla wins the Tesla Model 3 is less expensive to own than a Toyota Camry over five years. And the further out you go, the better, the bigger the advantage. But really, I think the thing that should be looked at more is cost per mile. That if, if a, I believe currently the cost of a Tesla Model 3 works out to about 15 cents a mile. The cost of, if, if it's going to last half a million miles, if it gets you know, the efficiency that we understand that it gets, if you put all that together, the cost of a Tesla Model 3 really works out to about 15 cents a mile when the average US car is evaluated at roughly 60 cents a mile. So, and it's gonna get better. And the, the compact, I'm the numbers I'm coming up with for the, to give a little preview of the video I'm gonna be doing this week, the numbers I'm coming up with for the Tesla compact, I think it's gonna get down close to five cents a mile. And, so the, the case for Tesla is, first of all, they're, they're manufacturing better cars. They sell every car they make. And you, you put that over what happens in the marketplace. You know, you go out to 2030 and they're making, let's say, 20, 30 million. Well, you, you sort of have to ask yourself, okay, how many batteries are they going to make? It's not just cars either. It's grid storage. It's solar. So I did a video that's – I did a video over a month ago that is – continuing to get a lot of views where I talk about the potential for Tesla to reach $40,000 a share in 2030. And I, I know that sounds crazy to most people when they hear it, but it's really simply taking what we learned on battery day, that they hope to be making three terawatt hours of high nickel batteries, and they expect to be buying a lot of batteries from their partners, from their suppliers. And if you apply, let's say six terawatt hours of batteries Okay, what is that? What do the batteries go into? Well, it's going to be a lot of lithium iron phosphate battery. I don't know how specific you want me to get here, but a lot of the a lot of the batteries are going to go into grid storage. A lot of the batteries are going to go into lower end vehicles like the Tesla Compact. Well, how many vehicles is that? Okay, 
And how many grid storage devices is that? How many power walls? How many mega packs is that? And how much do those things cost? And what revenue does that translate to? And in a not, I don't think a ridiculously optimistic scenario, it translates to $4 trillion of revenue in 2030. Six, ter six terawatt hours of batteries. And if you give them any kind of multiple at all on $4 trillion of revenue, you know, what's their market cap? Well, Warren, let's come back to the evaluation. So uh, let's get your, your laundry list or the key list of why you're, you're hot on Tesla. What you talked about great product, we talked about costs associated with battery, which is the, the key piece of the cost. What are other reasons why you, you love this product? So you love this company so much. I think it's and, the- And I've got follow up on, on each of those. Sure, it's, it's, the, it's the relentless uh, iterative um, development. It's, it's the engineering. It's okay, we've, 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 we've achieved the same thing with SpaceX. I, I, you know, like I'm fascinated by, I'm more fascinated by Tesla as a company than I am Tesla as a stock. I make videos about the stock because the viewers seem to be interested. I mean, interested in it because I own a lot of stock. But I, I, I'm more interested in the company, the engineering, the, the, and the future that it leads us to. Same thing with SpaceX. The, the, if you're watching, like the thing I'm most excited, I'm excited about a lot of things. If you look at what SpaceX is doing with Starship, they're building rockets in an open space, right? And they're blowing them up and then they build another one. And actually they're already building the next three and they blow it up and clean up the mess and stick another one out there. And they, you know, where everybody else is afraid to have something blow up, Tesla's like, well, that's gonna happen. And, you know, they keep blowing them up and crashing them until it works. And yeah. okay. that fascination, it, it's a fascination with a totally, well, there's, the, there's Elon's first principles approach, which is where do you want your atoms and how do you get them there? instead of this is how we do things, what other ways can we do to get the atoms in the right position? You know, just as an example. And then, okay, we tried that, it didn't work. Let's try something else. Let's try something else. Let's try something else. Let's keep trying what worked, what, what didn't work. What can we learn from this? That rapid innovation, that aggressive engineering, that commitment to making it better and better and better. The commitment to saying, wait a minute, are we at a local maximum? Can we try a different approach? Can we do better? Um, Neuralink, the boring company, the 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 outside. I, I've always thought of myself as an outside the box thinker, and in a sense, sometimes I've had jobs like honestly, being a lawyer, being a lawyer is totally an inside the box job, and and being an outside the box thinker and as an attorney is painful, mm -hmm. um, and and as a real estate agent, I think it's somewhat painful, and and as when I worked for a judge, when I worked for an insurance company. Um, outside the box thinkers don't really fit. And I love watching what Tesla, SpaceX, Boring Company, Neuralink are doing because they're basically just totally outside the box. And that is what advances um, technology, humanity is just doing the same thing over and over again without learning from it doesn't get you anywhere. So that's what excites me about everything Elon's doing and, and some other companies too, the other outside of Elon's companies. Yeah, okay. We, we talked last time we had a conversation, we, we briefly talked about the software and the services. Maybe you could share quickly your views. And I know you've got some specific views on insurance on, on where, that, where that's going. Uh, case in point, the, the uh, Morgan Stanley analyst finally, I guess, turned around. Adam <laughs> what, Jonas? Street, Adam yeah, Jonas? Street, yeah, the, the main banks seem to be a bit slower to catch up, but in, in, in the recent report, you know, did some of the parts and really he valued different pieces and his rating pretty much have caught up to, well, now it's behind again, <laughs> but uh, maybe you can talk through your views on the different pieces of Tesla that, uh, again, specifically your views on software and the services uh, potential. So, um, sorry, give me one second here. I don't know what I no just worries. did. What did I do? Thanks. I'm, I'm like screwing this up. Okay, so first of all, I think software for Tesla, different people mean different things by it. There is one overriding software piece that matters more than anything else, which is full self-driving. 
full self-driving leads to robo taxi robo taxi leads to a transportation revolution robo taxi leads to insane profits yep there are other software things people talk about like using the tesla as an entertainment platform and people downloading video games or doing other things on the screen in the tesla and i think that is a i don't want to say it's nothing but i think it's tiny i think it is trivial compared to robo taxi um, insurance. I don't know if you wanted me to talk about insurance now or later, but you know, so I, I, and the, let me just address this idea that like, people are going to download games on their Tesla. When I'm in my Tesla or, or I mean, I'm in some robo taxi, I've got my phone with me. I'm used to playing games on my phone. I have an alternative platform right with me. I don't know that the, the, the gaming platform in the Tesla is such a compelling experience that it's going to take me off my phone. And the other thing is when you look at this device, right? There's a billion of these, right? And maybe there's two billion. I don't know how many smartphones there are um, between iPhones and Androids. There's, you know, a billion or more probably. It's going to be a long time before there's a billion Teslas, probably never. So the volume that the platform is going to achieve, you know, maybe there's going to be a hundred million of them in 2030. That's, that's a little optimistic. I think it could happen. How many people are using it for gaming? How many people are using it for entertainment? I don't, I don't think that's a big driver of the value of the company. I'm not saying it's nothing. I think it's something, but I think it's, and it's something other car companies don't really have, but I think that's fairly small. I just think the, I could go in, in great depth about why RoboTaxi, RoboTaxi is one of the big reasons I think Tesla is revolutionary. Um, so I could go into great depth in that. And I'd be happy to talk about Tesla insurance. I have very strong opinions about that too. Yeah. Uh, I think some of your videos and others have covered FSD quite extensively. So, so maybe we'll, we'll, we'll put that aside. And I think your views on insurance is a bit, a bit different. Maybe you can talk about your, your views on that. Sure. I think you're, you're less optimistic than the, the conventional wisdom on this, right? Right. So you always got to be careful when Elon disagrees with you. Yeah. So, so I, I, I disagree with what I've heard Elon say about insurance. I believe he said something like he expects insurance to be... I don't know, 20 or 30% of, of vehicle revenue. And I, I think that insurance goes to zero. I think insurance matters in the short run while people are buying cars, because if other insurance companies are pricing Tesla insurance high and Tesla is able to undercut them because it has better data about the driver, yeah. then Tesla will be able to sell insurance for less. And that makes the car more attractive to the buyer if there's an insurance option that isn't outrageously expensive and is less expensive than other cars, which it should be. Teslas are, are in general safer than other cars. They have lower crash rates. They, have, they are safer in terms of crash protection. So they're less likely to have injuries. Um, I saw there was, a, there was a really bad wreck near me where the Tesla was just driving down the road and a, a BMW was going 100 miles an hour and crashed. You know, Tesla was making a left turn, had no, no idea that 100 and some mile an hour BMW was barreling the other way. And the driver, one of the passengers in the Tesla was killed. It was a hit on the passenger door. The driver walked away and uninjured in a hundred mile an hour side impact crash. Um, and the, I think everyone in the BMW was killed. So, or badly injured, maybe some of them were killed. So um, I think they're very safe. They're very good at crash avoidance. They're, they're, there's a lot of good reasons. And, and the people who tend to drive Teslas tend to be safer drivers. So all those factors together, it should cost less to insure a Tesla. And if other companies won't, charge less to insure a Tesla, then Tesla can charge less to insure a Tesla. And there's another benefit that Elon talked about, which I buy into, which is as they process insurance claims, they learn how to make the cars better so that they're easier to repair. So I buy that. But the problem is if we go to a robo taxi or a full self-driving model, and if we believe, and I do believe this, that self-driving will be better than the average human driver, then it will be 10 times better than the average human driver, then it will be 100 times better than the average human driver, it doesn't take very long to get to no crashes or, or very, very few crashes. And if you have one-tenth the number of crashes, then you have one-tenth the number of insurance claims and then insurance costs one-tenth as much and you're not making that much revenue from insurance. And if you have one-hundredth the number of crashes, then the cost of insurance should go to one-hundredth. And if you have sentry mode, then you're protected from vandalism and, and burglaries. So there's a lot of things about Teslas that reduce the claims experience. And when you reduce the number of claims, you reduce the number of, um, okay. and then, and one other detail is 
Elon specifically said on, at Autonomy Day that Tesla would have its own fleet. And this is a where I have a radically different view than other people. And I'm really not sure. I think Elon has offered conflicting views on this. Um, I think there's a strong chance that Tesla, that most Teslas produced go into Tesla's fleet, that Tesla sells few cars, takes the cars that it makes and puts them out as robo taxis. Well, if, if Tesla owns the vehicles and runs them as robo taxis, which he's very clearly said they're going to do with a fleet of his, as he said, 10 million vehicles in the fleet at Autonomy Day and the Tesla fleet. Well, you're not making insurance revenue from cars you own yourself. And, and I, one, there's one more detail about this, which is if, if you're driving the car in self-driving mode, if the car is driving and you are not, then when there's an accident, Tesla is liable and you are not. Not, not that you aren't, but Tesla is. And as a personal injury lawyer, if I have a choice between suing a $500 billion company and a guy with $500,000 in, in, his, in, his, in his IRA that I can't touch anyway, I'm going after the $500 billion company. You know, he's got a, this guy's got a $100,000 insurance policy, but there's a $500 billion company. I'm going after the $500 billion company. There's a bigger pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. So, yeah. okay. So I don't, I don't see insurance. If self-driving is real, then insurance becomes very small in, in okay. five, 10 years. Uh, Warren, we, we've covered quite a bit here. I'm going to take a pause here and maybe rephrase or summarize and also comment and ask some follow-up questions, okay? And maybe even the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe comment a bit on entertainment and insurance. My, my personal view as a user, okay, as a, as a customer, um, and I'll, I'm going to uh, res respectfully disagree uh, with what uh, you said in terms of the potential. Um, I've had the why... I've had the X for three and a half years, and I recently, less than a, year, a month ago, I got the Y. And uh, um, I've slept in the car with the blow-up mattress for six, seven days now, for camping, camping in uh, New Jersey. Okay. That's my dream with the Cybertruck. That's my dream with the Cybertruck because I want to, <laughs> yes, I want to yes. camp in it. I've got, I've got a Cybertruck in order as well. But with the Y, uh, it's actually very comfortable camp mode. But um, when I'm charging and when I'm in a campsite, you know, there's a few hours per day where I want to be entertained. You know, I've got my iPhone, I've got my large iPad. It's just much more comfortable with the stereo sound. It's a beautiful surround sound in the Y. Um, so I think there's a reason why Elon invited or allowed Tencent to be an early investor, I think 8% into, into Tesla. There's a lot of skills there. So I could see even before FSD, where I'm driving autopilot, I don't have FSD barely yet, I'm actually consuming quite a bit of the content on the Tesla. So now I'm primarily watching YouTube, <laughs> your channel and Netflix, but there will obviously be gamers as well, right? Especially when, when the high speed comes in 5G or the, the SpaceX connection. So I, I kind of see, I'm excited, uh, perhaps, probably obviously won't be as big as FSD, but I see entertainment and gaming as potentially something to, to look at. Um, again, uh, just, just for the sake of discussion, on insurance, um, I completely agree with you. FSD is coming. I don't know exactly is as fast as Elon likes. However, we're about a million Teslas now. Okay. How many cars are out there? There's about a million. A, there's two billion, roughly two billion vehicles in the world, and there's one million Teslas. Yeah. Yes. So, so if we 100x, we're 100 million, um, but even if FSD is perfect, even if every single major government, every major city allows FSD, which is a big if, I, I, you're a lawyer in that, insurance will still exist and is needed because you'll have other drivers that are drunk driving that are not on a Tesla, right? So I don't think insurance, uh, it's gonna be a while before Tesla takes over all the fleet, FSD, and it's gonna be decades, if not a century before all the other cars go away. So if you have 1% of bad drivers that are not Tesla FSD, you're going to need insurance. Okay, let me let me just address that quick. Okay, anyway, so I, I, I think let, it's interesting. Let, it's just kind of let, let, me that. let me address the insurance first and I'll go back. Hopefully, if I remember, we'll go back and I'll talk about the, the in-car software. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll really, no, let me really address the in-car software. The two examples of software you addressed are software where Tesla doesn't get any revenue. You watching YouTube videos or you watching Netflix videos doesn't make any revenue for Tesla that I know of. If it does get revenue, it's not much from that. So if there, if there may be 
software applications where Tesla will make revenue, but those two I don't think are, are, are there, or at least it's not much. So the insurance thing, if the Tesla vehicle is hit by another car and it's the other car's fault, then the other car's insurance is responsible. So your insurance as a Tesla owner doesn't matter if it's the other car's fault. Now, the exception, the big exception to that, especially here in Florida, is there's a lot of uninsured drivers and there's a type of insurance called uninsured motorist coverage. And certainly that comes into play, but a large chunk of your car insurance premiums is for liability, your liability for causing property damage to another car or your liability for causing injury to another person. And those components of insurance should go away quickly. Okay. Um, it, assuming uh, you're correct, it depends on when, when self-driving comes into play, but let's be clear, self-driving is already there. You're already, I assume, do you have full self-driving on your Model Y? Unfortunately not. Okay, did you have it on your X? Uh, I've purchased it, but I'm not a beta. Okay, so there's a lot. Anyone who has self full self driving, I don't. I don't. Here's a question: I don't know the answer to. What percentage of people who have self driving use it? What percent of the time? So, if the average Tesla driver is on self drive, is on autopilot 90 percent of the time, let's say, in theory, you're supervising it. You're still responsible. But as a plaintiff's lawyer, I'm still suing Tesla. Because if it failed to avoid an accident or it created, if it caused an accident, if the software yeah. causes the accident, if the you know FSD causes the accident, well then Tesla's on the hook for it and I'm going after Tesla. So I, I think the insurance, the case for insurance revenue, let's, let's use a simple number, okay? Let's say that the average car pays $1,000 a year for car insurance. It's probably the wrong number. It's probably closer to 1,500, but a thousand is an easier to number to work with. Um, you know, we pay, I think we pay 1500 a car in my house, but we live in a more expensive community. The, the, the insurance rates are higher here than there are some other parts of the country and a thousand is just an easier number to work with. So if liability insurance is 50% of our insurance and the car is drive and we go switch, shift to world of, you know, keep in mind, there's, I, my car got vandalized. My car got burglarized. My car got hit by a hailstorm. You know, there's, a, we actually had a hailstorm claim years ago on our car. Um, there's a, lot, a variety of claims that your insurance covers. And, and, but if you look at your insurance and you see how much of it is uh, personal injury liability, how much of it is property damage liability, how much of it is, or I think it's bodily injury liability, bodily injury liability, property damage liability, uh, personal injury protection uh, covering for you when you're injured in the car in an accident. You know, half the accidents are caused, and for the average car, half the accidents are caused by another by the other car. Right? Yeah. For half the accidents so, out there. For half the accidents you're going to have in an, in an, an objective world all, of all cars, the average car, half the accidents involved in are caused by the other car and half are caused by your car. If you're driving a car with self driving and it's better than the average human and it's better than you, then more of the accidents are caused by the other vehicles. You're eliminating a chunk of accidents. And so the you go from $1,000 a year to $800 a year to $700 a year to $600 a year. So if the car costs $50,000 is probably the rough average price of a Tesla today. And you're get and Tesla is getting $600 a year in revenue. Let's say 500, 500 is an easier number. $500 a year in revenue from 10 million cars. Right, well, $500 a year in revenue from that one car that cost $50,000. Then over 10 years, they got $5,000 in revenue on a $50,000 car. Now you compare that to the $30,000 a year that Elon says the car is going to make from RoboTaxi. And I think that was for your owning it, not for Tesla owning it. If Tesla owns it, I think it's $50,000 a year in revenue. So would you rather make $50,000 a year on your car or you know, which is a bigger impact, the $50,000 a year revenue uh, profit from RoboTaxi or the okay, $500 a year point. from insurance? I yeah, I, I think I think you're right. I think I think it's not that it's zero. It's just that relative to the potential of FSD, it pales in comparison. It's, but even it's even just yeah. the price of the car, if the car is $50,000 and you make and Tesla makes $5,000 in revenue over 10 years on insurance, that that's not 20 or 30 percent. That's 10 percent. You know, it's it's yeah. not that much. Yeah, yeah. FS, FSD is a big well revenue. Generator. 
I, I, that makes sense to me. Okay. And obviously I'm talking to a, a, a DUI lawyer as well. So it's, <laughs> oh. I'm sure you understand this space much better than we do. Well, I mean, you know, that, that's another thing we could talk about is one of the most amazing things about the FSD revolution is how much, I, I say this, uh, I don't mean it in, in a negative way, but the, da the damage it will do to so many industries, including yeah. drunk yeah. driving defense, personal yeah. injury cases, that's, that's well, a fascinating and if, component. And the beauty is it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Because in trucking, in, in long haul, in a lot of places like Texas or in the farmland country, if you have it working just in the highways where let's say a truck drives three hours straight, that itself is, is massive, right? Yes. Uh, where everyone's thinking, well, it won't work in Hong Kong. It won't work in New York. Well, it'll take longer because that's hard, right? Even humans can't drive that well. But there are a lot of a lot of these routes that that could work, like now. I think, you know, I'm sorry, but you just touched on something I think is really interesting, which is where will it have the most trouble working? So, and it's one of the striking differences between how AI works and how humans work. So, I have two two children. One is 19, and one is 15. And they drive. One is learning to drive and get on a learner's permit, and one is driving, and they are both afraid to drive on a highway. Ha! Huh. Right. Interesting. We think. Really. We think that city driving is going to be the hardest for AI, but AI has already mastered highway driving, and and, and I'm uh, my kids are not the only ones. Um, I remember in college, I, there was a, a a girl at college who was afraid to drive on the highway. There's some reason why young drivers are like I. I don't, I, you know, I drive a lot and I don't think any driving is hard, um, but I'm just very adaptable, whatever. I can drive in Manhattan and I, you know, it's, it's, the rules are different and you just adapt. But I, I think that, um, I, I don't think it's clear that, that city driving will be as hard for AI as we think it will be. I, I don't, I don't know what the challenges are. I think that's a, it's a fascinating topic. What is going to be the hardest part? You, you see the, the videos of the traffic in India you know, mm. with these insane intersections and this huge volume and people driving like in crazy manners and pedestrians all over the place. And I can see where that's going to be challenging, but I don't think driving is, you know, I don't think driving is that, it's one of these uh, conversations I get in with people. They're like, oh, driving, like I, I always point to, everybody said you couldn't land an orbital rocket booster and SpaceX did it. And they're like, oh, that's much easier than driving a car. Like, really? They didn't say that before they landed at the orbital rocket booster and they landed an orbital rocket booster five years ago. They've landed 70 of them, 60 some rocket boosts, one of them seven times now. No one else has even tried to land an orbital rocket booster. The closest is Rocket yes. Lab just sort of kind of brought one back, but I didn't really land it. You know, no one has even tried to land an orbital rocket booster. That was five years ago. So maybe it wasn't that easy. If it was so easy, right, then why hasn't somebody else done it yet? Mm. So I, I think it's it's challenging. And, and you know, it's the, it's the edge cases is the big challenge. I'm not sure that there's more edge cases in cities than there are in rural areas. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Okay. Hey, Warren, I want to come back to your first one about cost per mile, total cost of ownership. I love um, that one. Yes, yes. Um, I, I haven't seen any content on Compact side. Can you explain the, you're estimating currently about 15 cents a mile for Teslas and versus 60 for ICE, and you think the Compact's five cents a mile? Can you kind of talk through that? Oh, sure. There's a huge numbers. Yeah. Sure. So um, I'm just going to assume the 60 cents a mile because that's the IRS reimbursement rate. It's probably off by a little bit, but I don't think it's off by that much. The, at Autonomy Day, Elon said that the current cost per mile of the Model 3 was 18 cents a mile. And it wasn't just him. There's a company called Tesloop, T-E-S-L-O-O-P, that operates in Cal or operated in California. And they also estimated they, they were running Model 3s on these uh, in this particular, it was like a loop where they would go from San Diego to Santa Monica to Las Vegas, maybe. I think I, th I think I have that right. And they estimated their cost of the Tesla Model 3 around 18 cents a mile. And that was before Elon said it at Autonomy Day. So- um, mm. Oh, that's before the new battery technology. That's be a lot, it's before the new battery technology, absolutely. This is, you know, Elon said it at Autonomy Day, which was before the new battery technology. And Tesla said it before Elon said it at Autonomy Day. So 
I think it's a, a rough guess. So one of the key components in cost per mile is how much did the vehicle cost and how many miles will you get out of it? So if your vehicle is going to last 300,000 miles, which is the number that Elon referred to at Autonomy Day, then you amortize the cost. Let's say it's $30,000 over 300,000 miles, and you get 10 cents a mile for amortizing the cost of the vehicle sure. over the mileage. Sure. If you all of a sudden take that same vehicle and it gets a million miles, then the $30,000, and I, I'm using $30,000 because okay. it's an easy number, yeah. Yeah. $30,000 over a million miles, now instead of thirty, now instead of 10 cents a mile, it's three cents a mile for amortizing the vehicle. So that okay. lowers the cost per mile. So that takes you from 18 cents a mile, probably below 15 cents a mile. The, some of the other key components of the cost are, okay, how many miles do you go per kilowatt hour? What does a kilowatt hour cost? So currently, Tesla's best cars are getting around, uh, I think they're getting around five miles a kilowatt hour. If you have a 250 mile range on a 50 mile on a 50 kilowatt hour pack, it's five miles a kilowatt hour. So if a kilowatt hour costs 15 cents a kilowatt hour, and you do the, you do the math, which I, I don't have off the top of my head, I'm trying to think it through. Um, if it's 15 cents a kilowatt hour and you get five miles a kilowatt hour, then it's three cents a three cents a three cents a mile. I think that works out yeah. right. So if you can increase your efficiency, which I think the Tesla Compact will do, and S Tesla has been increasing their efficiency, right? They were at six cents, yeah. they were at six miles, or they were at four miles a kilowatt hour. Now they're up to five miles a kilowatt hour, or over five miles a kilowatt hour. No, so the Model S is four miles a kilowatt hour right? Because it's 408 miles or 402 miles on a 100 kilowatt hour pack. Um, I think the standard range plus is 260 miles on a 54 kilowatt hour pack. So that's getting close to five miles a kilowatt hour. So I think the compact is going to be closer to seven miles a kilowatt hour. That's a, another conversation. So if you get that number, the number of miles per kilowatt hour up, then you're reducing your cost of electricity per mile. Down, you're taking the cost of electricity per mile down. Then you get things like tires. Like currently, a lot of cars are using 18, 19, 20-inch wheels. The tires are very expensive. It's $400 for a set of tires. Um, Elon has said they're going to use low rolling resistance tires. I think the compact is going to be optimized for efficiency. So if you are able to get tires that last 100,000 miles instead of 50,000 miles, and if you're able to get tires that are more fuel efficient, which smaller, I just, I'm working on this video right now. Uh, car and driver did a test on a Volkswagen Jetta, I think, or a Volkswagen Golf, where they did 15, 16, 17, and 18 and 19 inch wheels. And the 15 inch wheels were 10% more fuel efficient than the 19 inch wheels. And they actually had better acceleration. Um, so if you design the car to be more efficient, and if you, if you get that million mile range, if you get um, the, the lithium iron phosphate battery cells cost less per kilowatt hour. So, you know, with all the engineering changes, you get the vehicle weight down. There's all these things they're doing. I just basically ran, I, I, I don't remember the calculations off the top of my head, but I ran the numbers and I was able to get the, I think there's gonna be multiple versions of the compact. And I was getting the, the European hatchback that Elon talked about down to five cents a, uh, a mile between amortizing the cost over a million miles and the, the more efficient terms of energy. And then you're spreading, instead of buying 20 sets of $400 tires, you're buying 10 sets of $100 tires because the tires on smaller wheels are less expensive. You know, and you put all that together and I, I think, and I, that was kind of rough math I was doing, but if I'm off by a couple of cents and it's no, seven cents a mile, still amazing. Yeah, roughly it makes sense. Yeah. And that matters for robo taxi because if you're in the long run, the goal is to get the, like, I'm expecting when robo taxi finally becomes live, it's going to be a dollar, a dollar fifty a mile. But that's not really revolutionary, right? It's when you get the cost below 60 cents a mile that the average car owner says, why do I own a car anymore? And then it's like, well, if you can get the cost down to 10 cents a mile, can you imagine? I mean, just take a step. Take a step back. If you're watching this video, or, 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 just take a step and think: Is what if the cost per mile of transportation dropped? Personal door-to-door -door transportation dropped from sixty cents a mile to ten cents a mile. You know, 
how much does that change the world? And it's really yeah. hard. It's really hard to get your head around that one. It's not as easy as you think, but it's, and then you say, well, what if we did a van and the van seats 20 people and it goes on long distance trips and you get the cost down below a penny a mile? Yeah. I mean, the environmental impact on that, because instead of having 2 billion cars and growing, you might only need a quarter billion or half a billion because of the utility, right? Well, there's another there's side to that, which is if you lower the cost of transportation that much, demand rises. Right, you have the supply and demand curves, and if you if you radically lower the cost, then the the demand goes up. And well, so, uh, with, with FSD, and instead of using it an hour a day, which is probably my average, you know, you can use this twenty three hours a day, twenty yeah, hours a day. Right? I think practically speaking, but there isn't when when you achieve market saturation, there won't be demand for more than you know there won't be a a lot of demand for a six hour window from midnight to six a.m. But yes, you can use it a lot more. But I just mean. If you're the average individual, let's say I live in South Florida. A lot of people, not me, but a lot of people in South Florida like going to Disney World. Right now, it's a big trip. You got to stay in a hotel. You got to drive three hours each way. What if you just, a car pulls up to your door and takes you there for $20? Well, it, you know, what if instead of, instead of the, the, the spending a weekend in Disney World cost you all that money and took you all that time, you were, able, yeah. you were able to ride without paying attention and it took you less time because the vehicle goes faster because there's a boring company loop tunnel that takes you straight there and you go 120 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour. And instead of staying at a hotel, you just ride home at the end of the day. It costs <laughs> you less to ride home and ride back the next day oh, and yeah. it's quicker then staying in a hotel off property. You know, it's just like, it's so mind boggling how, and that's just one tiny example of how this could radically change the world. And then what happens is instead of there being fewer vehicles, it may be the demand goes up so much, we need more of them. Mm. It's, hard, it's hard to get your yeah, head around. It's, 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 you've got two opposing forces, but net and net is good. It's, well, you, it's fantastic for, for economic efficiency. As Elon said, it improved 5X is the, uh, the economic efficiency of your simulation, but it's hard to get your head around. We can't know what demand would be if the cost yeah. of travel got down to a penny a mile. We, yeah. we, we can't uh, even come uh, to grips with that. Uh, again, even before FSD, you know, in the past, in an ICE vehicle, which I don't enjoy driving, you know, Toronto to New York, New York to Tampa, I would fly, right? Yeah. But partly because of COVID, but mainly because I enjoy driving a Tesla with autopilot. I'm pretty much just driving. I've driven Toronto, New York to Tampa. And, and, and you know, I'll take my time, but it's enjoying, right? With FSD, absolutely. Right? If I'm not, if I'm not time constrained, it makes it makes a lot more sense. Um, so I, I think I think that that is a good vision that you painted, uh, Warren. Appreciate Let me ask that. you a question. When's the last time you got an oil change? <laughs> exactly, right? When's, exactly. How, how often do you go to gas stations or charging yeah. stations? Do you, do well, you charge it? You uh, charge at home, right? Yes. Right. So, yes. so every time I, because I still have a gas powered car, I still have a nice car. Every time I go to a gas station, I feel like an idiot. Every time I get an oil change, I feel like I'm getting ripped off. Every time, and then, you know, the, think about the robo taxi world. Every time I have to shop for car insurance, it's like, what a pain this is. Every time you, you go to a mall and you have to park your car and then figure out, try to remember where you parked and oh crap, it's raining. Now I got to go out in the rain and find my car or it's cold out or, you know, whatever. And in a robo taxi world, the car drops you off at the front door, picks you up at the front door. You don't have to look for a car. Parking lots vanish. It, it's so, it's so revolutionary. It's hard, you know, it's really hard for us to come to grips with how, yeah, and you know, yeah. we think this is something we've never seen before, but you know the term search engine optimization and and social media marketing. Sure. Did those did those concepts exist thirty years ago? Right, the world has already changed plenty. We're we're just seeing more change, but and we're just used to it. We're just like, oh, search engine optimization, search engine marketing, social media. We just think that stuff's normal now. That wasn't normal twenty years ago. Yeah, I, I think it'll stick. Take some time. I just convinced my brother because we drove from New York to Tampa uh, for a week in, in my uh, uh, in, in my walk. Actually, no, we took the X that time, and he was poo pooing on Tesla, but he finally placed an order for a Cybertruck. <laughs> but 
but being an older gentleman and a bit old school, he refuses right now to buy FSD. I've got to bet on him that by the time the, the truck is delivered, that he will be upgrading at a much higher price FSD. Yeah. <laughs> but it, well, it, it takes time. It takes time for folks that haven't, if he didn't spend that week with me in the car and experience it, he would never have placed it. Yeah, I can. Because he's just so stuck on yeah. what he knew, right? Uh, and since he does real estate, he saw a few videos, I think a couple of years as well on his truck. And he's like, okay, I'll, I'll buy the truck but without the software. I'm like, Mike, you're making a mistake. Because <laughs> you'll be paying more a year from now. Right? I think that, I think the thing that people, it's, it's really hard to come to grips with like appreciating how much you're saving on a per mile basis. Appreciating how, like, honestly, I drove the Model 3, the Model, like I like driving gas powered cars. It's actually, I would say when I drove, in, in uh, you know, the one pedal driving with with a, a Tesla is actually uncomfortable. I've been driving for a long time and I like driving. I like driving stick shift. I like driving, you know, aggressively. I like driving sports cars. I like driving a regular car. Uh, and it is a little, I think there's an, the one pedal driving with a Tesla is a bit of an adjustment that I haven't made, because you know, I've only done it a couple of times. I haven't really made that adjustment yet. I'm so used to, because I kind of, I, I'm a mild hyper miler. I, I used to drive fast and be impressed at how fast I could go. Now I'm my car has a readout of how my gas mileage was for the trip. And I'm always trying to maximize my gas mileage. So I'm coasting down to lights and I don't accelerate hard. And you know, I'm still playing games with that and driving an EV is different. So anyway, sorry, that's a that's a tangent. Yeah, I think we're 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 both uh, gushing fanboys right now. Uh, I think I think the experience is amazing. You know, um my, uh, my parents caught COVID early this year and a few weeks before my mom caught it, uh, I, I drove her around in the X. And when I parked at my brother's house, you know, the, it does the dance, the goings. And uh, it made both of them dance. Yeah. Like I caught it on video and, uh, and that made it into sort of our uh, video of her to show the kids just seeing how happy she was to to see the car dance and dance with it. I think it's just experiences like this that that create, you know, fanboys like us that explains why Tesla doesn't need any marketing dollars. Right, right. So uh, okay, enough of the uh, enough of this. What let's uh, Warren, um, you know, Tesla has probably in the last six months gone from a lot of bearers, right? I, I had uh, Gordon Johnston on I had Dan Ives on, oh but even when I had them three, six months ago, it was not a foregone conclusion. It was still very much bear versus uh, uh, bulls. Now, pretty much the bull case is almost universal, right? Um, maybe from your perspective, um, do you see any other crazy upsides or that might not have been, might have been overlooked by other analysts or other uh, observers of Tesla that hasn't really been been popularized yet. Sure. Well, I'm going to leave Arc out of it. I'm going to leave Kathy Wood and, and Tasha uh, Tasha Kearney, uh, Tasha Kearney uh, uh, yes. into the Arc yes. funds. I'm going to leave them out of it because I think they do see most of it. I don't agree with them on everything, but I think they see most of it. I think the I think my battery revenue model. I don't I don't see anybody else talking about the battery revenue model that I'm pushing. Um, hey, can you idea, talk about that? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, it's plain and simple idea. How many batteries, pick a year. How many batteries do you think Tesla will make in that year? How many batteries do you think they will buy from suppliers in that year? What products, once you have a set number of gigawatt hours or terawatt hours of batteries, what products do those batteries go into? And how much revenue do those products generate? So you could say, okay, and I, I have these spreadsheets. If you check my videos out, I've done spreadsheets saying, okay. Um, and I don't think my 2030 numbers are based on products, but my, I sort of project out. How many power walls is that? How much does a power wall cost? How many mega packs is that? What does a mega pack cost? How many Model 3s? How many Model Ys? How many Tesla compacts? How many Model Ss? How many solar roofs? If you have, you know, rough estimate, the average solar roof installation or solar cell installation, solar panel installation will have three power walls, let's say. So how many, if you know you're gonna have this, if you, your battery numbers say we're gonna have this many power walls, well then how many solar installations is that and what revenue does that generate? And you just put those numbers together and it's, it's actually a fairly simple model. It leaves out the question of profits, of margins and earnings, 
which is, it's a big thing to leave out. But you can translate it fairly quickly into, okay, what's a good price to sales ratio or price to revenue ratio? And what does that, you know, this is how much revenue I see the company generating. And you add in, you know, you have an extra line for how much insurance revenue do they get? How much software revenue they get? I, I treat those as fairly small. And you put those numbers together and you say, okay, this is how much revenue I think Tesla is going to generate in that year. And then you can look at their price. You can pick a price sales multiple. I use 10, which is probably generous. I'm not going to back off from that. Um, but Apple's is over seven. And Apple is a more mature company today than Tesla will be in 2030. Okay, so, and, and I believe if, I, if my predictions are correct, Tesla's profit margins will be higher than Apple's because there's so much profit in robotaxi because the engineering of the cars, getting the cost of the cars down, the cost of manufacturing the cars and, and the price you're going to get for the cars. Um, I, I think Tesla's going to be in, I think the profits, as Tesla scales up, the profits go, even without full self-driving, the profits go up. With full self-driving, the profits are astronomical. So I don't think it's crazy to do that. So that's one approach is this battery revenue model. Okay, another approach, so the, that's one that I like. The one I truly believe in, which I'm not saying will happen, but it's just the one I should say that believe in it and I think should happen is if Tesla goes to a model where they stop, and I'm using the word stop loosely here, Tesla stops selling cars. And by stop selling cars, I mean, they keep every car that they make and they put every car that they make into the robo taxi network. And in my opinion, when you get the cost per mile down below 60 cents, the size of the market is so big that you can't saturate it by 2030. You can't make enough robo taxis to saturate the market if you get the cost per mile down, the price to the user down below 60 cents a mile. You just literally cannot saturate the market in 10 years. No matter, as, as fast as they grow, they won't be able to make enough to get there. So, um, and then you look at profits and you say, okay, they're, they're doing, let's say 60 cents a mile in revenue in revenue and their may, and their costs are five cents a mile. Well, that's 55 cents a mile in profit. And the typical robo taxi does a hundred thousand miles a year and you take off something for it, right? All right. You get to $40,000 a year in profit per vehicle. Then it's a question of how many robo taxis do they, do they make? And how, if they have a hundred thousand, I mean, think about this for a second. Okay. I'm sorry. This is going to come up with an outlandish number, but if you're doing $40,000 a year in profit, profit, and you got a hundred million robo taxis on the road, right? And keep in mind when you say, well, gee, that, that's, that's too many robo taxis. No, the fleet is 2 billion. The global fleet is 2 billion. If each robo taxi replaces five cars or even eight cars, you still haven't replaced the fleet. You're not even halfway through replacing the global fleet. <laughs> So $40,000 a year in profit times 100 million cars. It's insane. And, okay. then you, and then you say they're still growing. What's the PE ratio? On, I think that's $4 trillion in profit. 40000 times 100 million, I think, is $4 trillion in profit. And a reasonable price earnings ratio for a company growing like that that's so successful would be 30, right? I mean... Amazon's price earnings ratio is 150. Apple's is around 30. Well, what's 30 times 4 trillion? That's $120 trillion market cap. So my $40 trillion market cap that I've been talking about is conservative by that standard. That's, this is why the robo-taxi scenario, and, and by the way, I should say, I think there's a, there's a model after the compact that gets the cost down. The, you know, I said 5 cents a mile for the Tesla compact. I think there's something that comes after the compact that gets the cost per mile down to a penny a mile. Yeah, it could be something like the Akimoto. I place an order for yes. that too, right? Uh, like Akimoto, but better. Akimoto is no or, or perhaps it's acquired because it, that, that's what that a, a friend of mine actually got his order in California. Right? He's one of their early ones. It's a fun. It's a. It's a it is a fun fun car to drive. Something like that because most trips don't have more than one to pack. More than one or two passengers, so there's a lot of potential. Um, what 
what did, let's talk sorry. about what wait a second did i did i lose you on the 120 trillion dollar market cap no 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 i i see it obviously we're both very uh very much uh in love with the business i i, I want to maybe talk a bit about what could go wrong because Excellent. things always do go wrong right um so maybe let's turn directions a little bit warren what what could go wrong to this amazing feature we both see Sure. The, the greatest threat to Tesla's success, which is also the greatest threat to the people of the world. It is also the greatest threat to the environment. If you believe that the EV revolution and the solar revolution is saving the environment, the greatest threat has been and always will be governments. Um, and I've been saying this, I, I'm a libertine, you know, off topic a little bit. I'm a libertarian. I was the libertarian candidate for governor of New York in 2010. And, and you, I don't know where you're from, but you look Asian. Um, and we frequently see people in American politics point the finger at either China or Russia. And I consistently reject these uh, aspersions that are cast on China or the Chinese government or Russia and the Russian government. It used to be Japan, if you remember, that Japan was, you know, competing with us. And there's all people in Washington, D.C. are always pointing the fingers somewhere else. The greatest enemy of the American people and really I think the world population is Washington DC and it has been for well the greatest enemy of the American people has been Washington DC for 200 years hasn't been a significant concern for um, for the but, rest of the but, world since 1950 uh, or so as it relates to EVs and Tesla Warren uh, Ch China is the largest and we mean the largest EV market they're obviously pushing this hard um, US I mean, Teslas are made here primarily right so so what would be the regulatory risk i don't see ev risk regulatory wise for china i see a risk for tesla uh probably more so i had a discussion with dan ives on this uh but maybe you can talk about a u.s side what's the what's the specific government risk to sure. Tesla? well i mean number one there's uh we already see taxes on evs in australia so taxing evs um I, I, if you go back in my channel, I have some live stream or some interviews. I don't think they're all live streams with political candidates. We had just had an election season and I did local candidates. I didn't do national candidates. I don't think I did any national candidates. Maybe it was a congressional candidate. But I would ask them, you know, you know I, I think there's this sense in government that they're entitled to their revenue streams. So if EVs don't pay gas taxes, and, and oh, our roads still need fixing. And it is a knee jerk reaction of politicians to say, well, we need to, ta we need to tax these EVs because they're still using the roads. Well, you know, and, and there's another side of it where there's people who want to subsidize EVs. I understand that, but we just, they're starting to tax EVs in Australia. I could completely see people deciding to tax EVs in America. There's antitrust. If Tesla is successful, keep in mind, Tesla will not be successful because they engage in anti-competitive behavior. Tests will be successful because they engage in competitive behavior because they make their cars better. They make their cars more efficient. They drive down the cost. They lower the price per mile. Nothing I have said was talking about Tesla getting outsized profits by raising prices. Tesla will get outsized yeah. profits by well, lowering prices. But, but government, people like Bernie Sanders, people like AOC, people like uh, Robert Reich, they hate billionaires. They hate successful people who, who they hate people who make other people's lives better without government. They believe that it's yeah, government. Okay. Uh, and, and so, but, yeah. Sorry, I just want to be more specific. I think if you're talking about, you know, picking on monopolies and billionaires, you know, we saw that with AT&T breakup. We're obviously seeing that with Facebook and Amazon and Bezos. Uh, it, that, that's just the way it is, right? Uh, when, <laughs> when power and is concentrated, uh, you need an enemy, just like China's an enemy for the US. In, in the case of Musk and Tesla at 1 million cars, I think we're still quite far off from um, dominating. Yeah, but at 100 million cars and an EV, a robo taxi network where they're the only operator, you could see somebody saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, we, you know, this is a monopoly. Um, yes. and, and the problem is that, and you have to go back to the history of antitrust. In Atlanta, antitrust law in America, antitrust laws were used by the established entities to fight against the upstart who was lowering prices. 
the, 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 the story that's the lie that is told to the American people and to other people, because I think the same thing happens in Europe and maybe it happens in other countries as well. I'm not as international as I should be. I lived in Japan, but um, the lie that is told to the people is we are doing this to protect you from that evil corporation. And the practical reality is they're doing it to protect other evil corporations from the good corporation. Um, and, and they're doing it at the expense of the consumers who are benefiting by the good corporation. I mean, look at Uber and Lyft. Uber and Lyft show up and the taxi operators get mad. Airbnb shows up and the hotel operators get mad. Well, who's providing a better service to consumers at lower cost? Right? Uber, Lyft, and Airbnb. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who, who puts the regulation in the way? Was this done for the consumers? No, this was done to protect established interests. It's established to protect the taxi license holders. It's done, to, it's done to protect the hotel industry, which have better, bigger and better lobbyists than the upstarts. So, and I don't think Elon wants to have lobbyists. But what I'm still not understanding, maybe, maybe my head's too thick for this. Um, I agree taxes will come and taxes should come, right? No, uh, no, they uh, shouldn't. <laughs> uh, uh, but in terms of things that Tesla is or doing that's uh, supported by the government, what is US or Chinese or European being clean, ESG, uh, Tesla is locally made. I mean, it checks off a lot more boxes than let's say Facebook. Um, right. I, know, so, I, I of agree. Course, of course, of course, at 100 million, if Tesla is the only monopoly player, I think that might be an issue. Well, right. I, but if they're lowering costs, if they're if everything they're doing is making people's lives better, and you always have the option of taking oh, your own. You say the same for Amazon. I do. Yeah, and so they're getting shit. Right? I do. I do say the same for Amazon. Amazon. I could go to Walmart. I can go to Target. I have the options I had before. Yeah. Um, so so it, it's expected that government will pick an enemy, whether it's a political enemy like China or sort of a, 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 a giant like Amazon. But Tesla is so far from that, right? We're talking about 2030s away. Okay. Wait, well, you would say that, but Bernie Sanders, AOC, and, and Robert Reich and others are already targeting Tesla because look, Elon, you could say that Elon is already the second richest, is he the second richest man in the world or just America? Um, I think the world, yeah. Right, so, you know, they don't like him. He's popular. Um, he says things they, he, they don't like. You know, it's stunning. I mean, think about this for a second. Have you, do you, has Joe Biden ever mentioned Tesla or Elon Musk's name? I mean, Donald Trump acknowledged Elon Musk, said he was a genius. Yeah. I think he picked on him a little bit too. He showed up for the SpaceX launch when they with, with the Demo 2 launch. Yeah. Right. Did Joe Biden acknowledge the amazing contribution SpaceX is making to the space program? Did Joe Biden or any Democrat acknowledge? He I mean, and he has no basis to threaten Tesla or SpaceX because he needs. He did a Chevy commercial. He did a Chevy commercial in his campaign. Okay. Okay. He hey, did. you know what? You know, uh, I, I see your point. I, I, um... I'm not. I'm not saying he is a threat. I'm saying. I'm saying that government in general, okay. and including other governments, including European governments, including Chinese government, that governments in general are the greatest threat. There's no competitive threat. There's no. There's no other company that poses a significant competitive threat to Tesla that I see. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see it. Um, yeah. I mean, I suppose an asteroid striking the Earth is a threat, right? <laughs> but yeah, no, no. I, I again, I, I follow you. I agree with you. I think, for example, I, I, uh, I'm a long-term investor in Tencent, and, and companies like Tencent and Ali and uh, to lesser extent Baidu in China, uh, like the fangs here, are so dominant that I don't see anybody taking them down the perch, except if they piss off the government. Right. And they and they know that, and they yeah. know to play with the government. Yeah. And the government probably there are probably people in the Chinese government who own stock or otherwise benefit from the success of Tencent sure. and and, yeah. and 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 that and that's I don't know I, I do not know near enough about China to comment on Chinese domestic politics. It's it's, it's the same thing, right? What, what there's actually very little threat to Amazon or Facebook uh, and Apple. Right. not for government, right? Just like there was almost no threat to AT&T until it was broken up. 
Right. And the funny thing is like Facebook is nowhere near a monopoly. I stopped, I stopped using Facebook mostly. I'm on Twitter most of the time now and I can switch over to, you know, parlor or, you know, there's so many choices that I could just turn it off and watch TV. You know, this notion that we, that there's some monopoly that controls my life. You know, if Tesla has a robo taxis, well, I still, you know, I could still buy a car until you make cars illegal. And there will always be some alternative transportation. It might just cost more, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I do agree with you. Again, I'm not the expert here, but I do not see any competitor ex China that is even close. Uh, in China, I'm, I haven't followed that closely, but because it's such a large home market and the Chinese are crazy innovators too, I could see I mean, you can see some features, let's say, from Neo that are a bit more advanced than Tesla's even, right? Uh, example, I, don't, I, don't, are, I don't agree with that, but... Voice activation. That's, 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 a, par- cool. that's, that's a parlor trick. I, well, yes and no. Battery swapping, which works, but... but battery anyway, sw- just, battery swapping is a joke. No, no, listen, listen, yeah. listen, I'm not saying overall it's better. All I'm yeah. saying is that in this huge market with such competitiveness, I could see emerging a player that could rival in size and innovation as Tesla. But outside of China, I right. don't see anything. I think right. I think China is the most likely place that a competitor would emerge. I would agree with that. I don't see it yet, but I think, um, and this is one of those things, one of the American, the, the misguided American views about China is China doesn't innovate, China just copies. If you listen to Jeff Don, China is the most innovative country when it comes to batteries. Uh, there's tremendous innovation in China. Um, I, I have, I don't know enough, but my impression of China is very competitive, great engineering, yeah. um, a lot You're of right. talent, and yeah. and and unlike America, I, I actually think that t- that China is a more capitalist country than America, and that China rewards success more than America does, and it doesn't fault success as much as America does. I you're think right. Yeah. You're right. And but you're also right that probably you're point zero two five percent of Americans that think that way. <laughs> so you're enlightened. <laughs> I, I'm. A, I just like I said. D, there is a propaganda machine operating out of Washington, D.C. and some other places that is constantly pointing the finger elsewhere. And both parties are behind that propaganda and both parties support that propaganda. So a huge and I, you know, I lived in Japan and I've been to South Korea and I've lived in I've visited Europe and and I have friends in China, you know, and I I want I used this funny thing. I I was a victim of that propaganda. I used to be afraid to go to China. Um, I don't, I'm not like eager to go now, but I kind of curious, I kind of would like to go. So. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Well, wow. Time's flying by. Warren, what, um, what other insights or observations might you have about Tesla, but also any of the other Elon crazy ventures that you'd like to share with our audience? Sure. I, I just made a video about SpaceX Starship that, um, just like I said, the, you know, robo taxi is going to lower the cost. Of, every, what Tesla is doing is going to lower the cost per mile of transportation, you know, from sixty cents a mile that we currently face for owning a car down to maybe five cents a mile or less. Starship looks like it's going to be a success, and before Starship, without going back into the history of it being much more expensive, Falcon Nine, the current workhorse of SpaceX. It's in the ballpark of $2,000 to get a kilogram to low Earth orbit. Maybe they've got it down internally to $1,000 a kilogram. Starship is going to get that cost down to $10 a kilogram to get something into low Earth orbit. It's going to be comparable to sending to, like, it's going to cost Tesla less to launch a kilogram into low Earth orbit than it costs you and I to send a package from New York to Shanghai. I I mean, just like, you know, wrap your head around that. And the potential for not other costs, but launch cost for a Mars mission could get down to $10 million, where other people talk about $1 billion. The, sure. the, the radical reduction in cost that SpaceX is achieving is, is, is mind boggling. And today is Monday. It could be Wednesday that we're gonna see the 15 kilometer uh, hop 
or, or belly flop test where they're going to launch to 15 kilometers and have it fly down. I think it's going to be Thursday or Friday, but they're, they're getting very close to doing that test launch. And it's going to be a few months or not or longer before they get into orbit, but that's going to radically change space. Neuralink is, if you haven't followed Neuralink, Neuralink is, is the matrix. I mean, it's, it's where Neuralink goes. Um, can you say, you know, can you upload your consciousness to the, you know, not, like in the short term, it's like curing brain diseases, which is fantastic. You know, helping the blind see, helping the paralyzed walk, dealing with epilepsy. There's a variety of brain diseases that can fix, but you don't have to go that far down the road, like 10 years with that you know, rapid iterative design engineering stuff to can you watch live streams in your brain without having to have a TV on? Can you live stream from your eyes so that others can see what you're watching? Can you save your brain state? Can you upload your mind to the to the to the cloud? You know, if you die, can your mind be replaced into another living organism or non-living organism? You know, it sounds like insane science fiction. I don't think it's that far off. And that's my one of my jokes about Elon. One of my jokes about Elon Musk is that he's been making science fiction reality since 1990. Yeah, I made up 1990, but you know, what uh, in 10 years' time, what do you see? Which are the Musk ventures do you see having the most impact? Well, on life on Earth, uh, Tesla, very clearly. On the future of humanity, SpaceX. And it's, it's a tough call. It's hard to know how far Neuralink can go. Um, in, in terms of, of ensuring that humanity survives a potential cataclysmic event, like a, you know, asteroid hitting the Earth or, you know, be making Earth, making humans a multi-planetary species is a big deal. Um, but I, you know, from our, our changing, the average person isn't going to Mars, right? You know, it'd be a million, you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet. You know, it'd be a long time before we get more than a million people off the planet. So for the average individual, that's sort of like interesting, but no big deal. Um, if Neuralink is able to cure brain diseases, if Neuralink is able to do more than that, I think that's the most impact on human life. Um, but it's all like, for me, it's thrilling. And the, you know, the boring company is kind of like an ancillary transportation benefit. I think it's very exciting, but not as big as the other three. And then there's, you know, there's probably other stuff. I think the, I don't know if you saw my video on this, but it, uh, Beyond Meat Impossible Foods, the transition from using animals to produce meat to either using plants to produce meat or lab-based meat based on cloning cells, those can really change a lot of things in our world as well. There's a lot yeah. going on. It's, it's really fun to watch all this stuff. Uh, it's yeah. amazing to see how much our world is changing, how fast, and I'm, I'm enjoying it. I love it. It's fun. Hey, Warren, I have a favor to ask you. Perhaps you could yes. use your great intellect to make a video once you find the answer. Uh, so I, uh, I once read a study uh, that was done maybe a couple of de decades ago by Cornell um, that said Earth should not, cannot support more than two or three billion people on, on a comfortable way, you know, for, uh, uh, before we, we kill it. Obviously we're 7.6, 7.7, 7 we'll go to 10 billion soon. So to me, the biggest challenge just we face as humanity, whether it's climate change, pollution, hunger, poverty, everything ties back to population growth. Until we solve population, you can't solve all the major issues. So even if Elon completely succeeds in reducing pollution from cars, um, we cure cancer, 10 billion people just isn't really, the earth is not enough to, to fit all, all these folks, right? So I, so, wait, so, uh, I, so I completely disagree with the premise. Okay, okay? all right. If, if, we, if we are able to stop, you know, if we are able to use the planet more efficiently then Earth can sustain a lot more people. And if we are able to expand into space and we are able to uh, sustainably de you know, develop space in a way, then there might be room for trillions of people. Okay. Um, and and, and yeah. you know, when you, when you, look, Elon Musk is brilliant, right? If, if we had limited, limited, if we had successfully limited population growth 50, 100 years ago, we might not have Elon Musk. We might not have, you know, people don't like Zuckerberg. I think yeah. Zuckerberg's amazing. I think Jeff Bezos is amazing. How many of these brilliant minds wouldn't have existed if we had limited population growth? Yeah. Um, I, okay. I, 
So okay, I don't, so I don't, I don't buy the premise from the very beginning. It's, that's Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus was wrong. Every time this debate comes up, the person who says that's the Earth can't handle it is wrong. Human ingenuity is the greatest force in the universe, and uh, overcomes all of these concerns. There is no limit to the number of people. This, I mean, maybe it's a quadrillion. I don't think there's a genuine limit to the number of people that Earth can that's support. That's great. That's great. So, so for your kids and mine, uh, hopefully you're right. And if not, we have uh, Bezos and Musk taking us to Mars. And uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, or this is this is a lot of fun. Uh, our time is up. Can you tell us how we can reach you? Sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter at wr4 the number four. NY is in New York, GOV is in governor. That's a leftover from my 2010 uh, governor campaign. I'm on YouTube. If you if you search for Warren Redlick on YouTube, you'll find my channel. That's where I'm putting most of my time right now. And I can't think of any other LinkedIn. Yes, I'm on LinkedIn. I don't really do much on LinkedIn, but I do accept if you send me a LinkedIn request and say, hey, Warren, I saw you on YouTube, then I'll I'll accept the I'll accept the link request. Great. Well, thank you so much, Warren. I'm Thank you for joining us. Please visit Wizards Institute to access the blog summary of today's session, to learn more about other speakers, and to network with other investment wizards. Wizards Institute, the number one community to learn smart investing and financial freedom.